we are going through our series. Uh, this is the book study on the book of Joshua. And uh, I'm excited because we are now in chapter 5. And uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, these spiritual events that took place before the conquest of the land. So that said, please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you. We ask you today that you would lead us, that you would speak to us, that you would illuminate your word for us to understand. Lord, thank you for the spiritual family, Lord, that you have um, uh, called us to be a part of. And Lord, today as we worship you through the listening, through the reading, through, le through the learning, uh, through your word, Lord, I pray that you would make our hearts open. Lord, that you would remove any barriers for us to listen to you, to hear what you are saying to us individually and also to us as a spiritual family. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. I just wanted to say as well that... Uh, I don't know if you notice, I'm just putting it here. Um, uh, you know, it's been 50 years and finally, you know, we made it to the finals and just sorry, uh, Kim Agai, if you're watching, I know you're, you're not happy, but me and Jai, we are celebrating and the rest, um, and the game is later this afternoon and uh, hey, um, just being humble right now, just, just putting this right here, okay? So... Not much. <laughs> so some violent reaction here in, in the in the uh, household. Um, all right. So that said, let me just give you, going back to the lesson, um, we're, we're going to look at the book of Joshua. At the start of the series, I give this uh, short book summary. If you're reading the book of Joshua and if um, you look at the 24 chapters. But before that, uh, Alex was saying, seriously, bro, Clippers hat. So, yeah, mm -hmm. um, hey, it's Father's Day and they won. So, <laughs> last Friday, let's see how it goes later this eve. So, Jai was uh, is celebrating right now. See? Woo! All right. <laughs> so, that said, let me just go back to the story before I get lost. And uh, going, looking at the book of Joshua, of course, looking at the summary of the book. If you're going to read the summary of the book, uh, if, sorry, if you're going to, I'm going to put a summary of the book. If you read the 24 chapters, here how it goes. All right. The first, uh, first five chapters is what you call the preparation of the land or the pre preparation for the promised land. This is uh, the uh, God uh, wanted them to prepare before entering the promised land. And we are at the very end of that chapter. And then, you know, we've noticed how God prepared them, reminding them about the word, reminding them to follow his lead, uh, you know, to consecrate themselves. And then we're going to look at these two spiritual events as part of that preparation. Next week, we're going to jump into the actual conquest of the land as the chapters in chapter 6 and actually half of the chapter, uh, almost uh, at the very end of chapter 5, opens up to the, what, to the uh, conquering Jericho. That's the first formidable uh, city that they're going to conquer, of course, with the help of the Lord. And then after that, 13 to 22 would be the distri distribution of the land. There's about a few chapters that we're going to study about that. And then at the end, this is Joshua's farewell address, you know, as they settled in the land that's, uh, you know, two chapter, 23 and 24. So today, we're going to go continue with the book study. And if you wanted to open your Bible, and that would be in Joshua chapter 5, looking at that summary, we would see that we're going to focus on the preparation for the promised land. And this is one of those important, vital, and crucial preparation that God is going to instruct the nations before they even start the battle or the conquest of the land. As we look at just the summary of this, what had happened last week was, you know, they crossed the, uh, the, the river Jordan and then God put, you know, asked them to put a stone of remembrance and then you could see that at the very end of chapter 20, uh, chapter 4, verse 24, it's not on the screen, you could open your Bible. So here's the description. It says that he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know, might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, so that the, you might always fear the Lord your God. All of those miracles that God did was that for, for that specific purpose. So that said, now in chapter one, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, here's what we will see. The, the reaction of the nations around them because of this miracle, an awesome miracle that God did in the midst of his people. In verse 1, we will see that now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanites king along the coast 
heard how the Lord dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over. Their hearts mel melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. So as you could see, the effect of this miracle, this is essential. This is very important because more than just this is a battle between nations and, and, the, and the conquest of the, uh, of the promised land. You have to understand this is also a showdown between the God of Israel and also the God of the nations that, they, that, that surrounds them. It's like a showdown, a match, like a, uh, it's proving who the real God is in a sense. And yet they realize because of this miracle that indeed their hearts, according to this, melted. They had no courage anymore. And then at that, imagine this. They were there at Gilgal. Of course, that's where we follow the story. They were camping. So imagine the, the atmosphere now i believe if i was there i'm ready to fight i'm ready to battle imagining if you have um, like the clippers you know you won game six and uh, you know you're down 25 points and and then you come back and all oh, the no sorry but here's what's happening here the nations were trembling they are uh in fear on what was going on so now after that God gives this instruction again to the nation, just like when he gave the instruction for them to carry 12 stones and to put that as a stone of remembrance. And there are two, two things here that we're going to talk about. A spiritual event that is very important, that they should follow, that they should celebrate. And the first one we're going to look at here is circumcision. I'm going to explain that a bit. And I know if you have kids, it's kind of like a little... You know, we're going to explain this as the Bible would explain this. And we have to talk about this and the spiritual significance of this because it is in the Bible. All right. You can see that in verse two as um, Joshua instruct, uh, God instructed Joshua to circumcise the Israelites. Here's the key word again. Why again? So, all right. And also the Passover. Remember, the Passover was celebrated 40 years ago when they left Egypt. And then you could see that on verse 10, because after the circumcision, after the renewal of the covenant, then they celebrated <coughs> the Passover, the event wherein they have to, again, go back and remember that God delivered them from slavery or God brought them from slavery to freedom. So that said, what is this? Here's the question. Why this spiritual event? Why? So why give this instructions? And also why is this important, crucial, vital, and all the other words that you could think of for them before, uh, you know, be, as part of the preparation, a spiritual preparation before the conquest of the land, before even what? Engaging their enemies in battle. So that's what we're going to look at today. That's what we're going to study today. The spiritual significance of the spiritual significance of these events for them then or before and for us today. Because you have to understand, this is a spiritual they, it has a spiritual significance to them but also to us as believers or Christians in our time today. So why so let me start with this. So because number one, when you talk about circumcision, this is the first you know, event that God asked them to do, that asked Joshua to communicate to the people because circumcision is a physical act that conveys a spiritual truth. Yes, it's a physical act that conveys spiritual truth. You have to understand because when I was studying this before, I thought that the circumcision... Uh, which means actually, which is a physical act, the cutting of the flesh. Actually, that's what it is. So the cutting of the flesh on that um, male, okay, private part, the cutting of that flesh or what they call the foreskin, that physical act to mark the male, okay? And why is that important? So here's what it is. It's a physical act, of course. And this is not, it's interesting because this is not just unique to the nation of Israel. Before I thought that, you know, the Israelites were the only ones circumcised and the rest of the nations are not. Actually, ancient Near East study would say that it is not only unique to them. Other nations around them actually uh, practice this as well. 
But yet, why is this unique for the Israelites? And also, why only males? There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of questions that we need to answer here. But yet, God asked them, you know, and God required them, actually, to use a stronger word for them to be circumcised before they could take the Passover. And it, this is indeed an act of consecration before the Lord. And why is that? Let me share to you some truths here and we have to go back as well in the book of Genesis to understand for us to understand this physical act that conveys a spiritual truth talking about circumcision so here's the truth here here's the first one circumcision is a sign or mark that they belong to the Lord they belong to the Lord that means they don't belong to any other gods, but they belong to the Lord. It's a mark. If you cut a skin in a certain part of your body, you would know that it would leave a mark. This is very specific in a very specific part. Why? I'm going to explain that more a little bit. But that cutting, it's a sign. It's a mark. Look at this in uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 3. So Joshua made flint knives. Why flint knives? The knives to cut the foreskin, to cut the flesh and circumcise the Israelites at Gibeah Haraloth. So why? So we go back to Genesis to understand this because when God was making a covenant with Abraham, actually that's where it started. Look at this in verse 10, in verse 10 of chapter 17. This is my covenant with you, according to the Lord, and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. You are to keep. That means this is going to be what? Every male among you shall be circumcised. Remember, from the very beginning, God is a God of covenants, right? There's a covenant loyalty. There's a covenant between us and God. It's not a contract. It's based on relationship, all right? And the loving kindness and the goodness of the Lord. So God, when he made a covenant with Abraham, this will be the mark. This would be the mark that they belong to the Lord. That they have a relationship with God. They are set apart for the Lord. Look at verse 11 as we continue to read this. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of covenant between you and me. Wow. Are you reading what I'm reading? Sign of the covenant. But yet it's interesting because when you read the text that we're reading right now in Joshua chapter 5, it is very interesting because they have not. Because if you continue with the story, it's not on the screen. What you would see here is that in verse 4, now this is why he did this. So all those who came out of Egypt, all the men of the military age died in the desert the way after leaving Egypt. All the peoples that came out have been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. So these are the next generation because remember, the first generation did not believe the Lord. In Numbers chapter 13, when the spies were sent, when they went back, they what? They didn't believe God. They didn't have faith. It was unbelief. So God... They didn't ask them to circumcise themselves. This is the first time that this generation will be circumcised. Why at this particular moment? Because at this particular moment is crucial. Before they enter and possess, you know, the promised land. That the, what God had promised to them, God has to, what? Make them realize and for them to remember that they belong to the Lord. That mark shouts... You belong to me. Why at that particular moment and uh, why at that particular part? Because here's what it is. Because that particular part comes to verse 2. Why that private part? Here's what it is. Because of renouncing. The circumcision is a mark or as a sign of renouncing the flesh and the world. This is that physical act of literally removing the flesh. Putting off the flesh because you have to understand the nations that they are surrounded with where they are going they worship a god or different small g gods that translate to some sexual practices that is detestable to the lord 
that they would slip around, that they would have prostitutes in the temples and stuff like that. And, and that's actually how, the way they would worship because there's a God that is a fertility God and actually the more you sleep with some pro temple prostitutes, the way is more honoring to their gods. Imagine that. And God was saying, no, because you belong to me. Imagine when a male would look at that part that has been the flesh is cut it reminds him that his body is no longer his own. It already belongs to the Lord. That means everything that I, you know, use or everything that I do rather with this body should be something that honors and glorifies God. Isn't that interesting? Because when you read the New Testament, again, if the Old Testament is a foreshadow of the New Testament, what is yet to come, Yet when you read the Old Testament, it's, isn't that interesting? Because the Bible would say in the Old Testament that we are no longer our own. We belong to the Lord. That there is that putting off of our old self and putting on of the new. This is exactly what was going on here. That mark, God was saying that you belong to me. You have a relationship with me. Actually, this is actual, the whole uh, 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 part of this is that they wanted, God wanted them to remember again, just like the stone of remembrance, the circumcision is an object, visual aid. I know it's not a good visual aid for a lot of people, but for male specifically, for us as we lead our family, it's a, it's a visual representation that we don't belong to ourselves, that we belong to God and whatever we do, in this body should be something that honors and glorifies the Lord. That's why when you look at this in verse 8, look at what happened here. At, at, after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained there and they were in camp until they were healed. This is going to be a little bit funny and awkward actually preaching about this, but this is very important. So here's what it is. As a male, okay, I've been circumcised. <laughs> and... Um, to be honest with you, it is not a pleasant um, feeling. Um, of course, it's not because I am part of the nation of Israel, but if now it's being practiced for many, many you know, medical reasons, um, hygienic purposes and stuff like that. But yet, at that particular moment when I, I think I was in grade school, when it happened, it was not fun. Actually, it's one of the things that you would never, ever forget. Even up to now, I'm just, I cannot forget the pain, the immobility that happened, and, and, and the vulnerability of that moment, to be honest. And imagine if you are ready to fight and God asks you to be circumcised, the male, which are most likely the fighting males. And at that particular moment, when you're reading verse 8, they were vulnerable. Actually, the nations around them could come in and fight and destroy them. So I could imagine the hesitations. Like, really? Are we doing this? Are we? But yet, you have to understand, they obeyed the Lord. Because circumcision, it, there's got to be that faith that you would obey. Because when you read the story, as we continue on verse 6, chapter 5, the Israelites had moved out in the move out from the desert 40 years until the men who would, would of military age uh, when they left Egypt had died, since they have not obeyed the Lord. So the difference between the first generation is this: they were the generation of unbelief. And this one. From the very moment that they crossed Jordan and started following the instructions of the Lord, they were called a generation who believed the Lord, that God would fulfill His promise. Even at that point of vulnerability, even at that point of being in pain, you have to understand the circumcision, it is a mark, yes, indeed, also, it is a cutting of the renouncing of the flesh or the, or the world, but also it's a step of obedience for them because this is a what? This is them 
acknowledging the covenant, the relationship that they had with the Lord, that they have with God. They were saying, yes, Lord, I belong to you. And yes, Lord, I'm renouncing, cutting my ties to the flesh so that I could follow you. This is that symbolism right here. That's why when you continue God, what God did at that particular moment after verse uh, 8 and verse 9, here's what happened. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Interesting. After this circumcision, the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, I have removed the reproach. What's that reproach? That means the shame of Egypt. I have removed the, sh the shame of Egypt. Because here's what you need to understand. God took them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in the hearts of people. Let me say that again. God brought them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in their hearts. That's why the first generation cannot obey and follow the Lord because Egypt was still there. So here's what happened. I have removed the shame Actual reproach is shame. That means in that, by following the covenant, by following the instructions of the Lord, God was saying, I have removed your shame. No longer you are a slave. You are free. No longer you are a slave, but you belong to me. There's the relationship that's being established here before entering the promised land or before conquering the promised land rather. This, the, the relationship, here's what it is. As the stone of remembrance is about who God is, the, the, the circumcision is a remembrance of who they are in the Lord. That they are, this is their identity, that they are sons and daughters of God. No longer they are a slave, but they belong to the Lord. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that interesting? So let me just go situate this for us a bit. You know, as a father, as male, there's that mantle of leadership that is given among us. Whether we like it or not, yes, marriage is a partnership. And um, the Bible made a suitable helper for me, a suitable partner. But yet, here's what it is. But there's that mantle of leadership that God places on man, on males, as we lead. That's why... That circumcision is specifically for us. And as we celebrate Father's Day, please remember that. Who we are and whatever tone or atmosphere or spiritual thermostat that we set in our home as fathers, it's really what's going to happen in our household. That's why we are called to lead. We are called to lead our family spiritually. So we are called to Remind them as we go back to, you know, chapter 4. And also remind them of the covenant, of the relationship that we have with God. Every time you go to the restroom and pee, there's that mark that's challenging you and I that we are leaders. I know this is so funny sometimes and so awkward, but really that's the whole purpose of this. You are called to lead. Looking at that in the physical aspect, of course, but there's a lot of spiritual significance in here that we should mine. So that said, we look at the New Testament. So why is this significance to us today now as believers and as Christians? And again, if you look at the New Testament, there was a fight between are we going to keep the circumcision of the flesh as a way, uh, you know, there's a fight between the... Uh, the priests who became Christians and those Paul and, and they were saying no circumcision is no longer the basis if you are a believer or not. No, it's not. That's why when you look at Colossians chapter 2, it says what it is. Because you belong to Christ. Colossians 2 verse 10. Because you belong to Christ, you have been made complete. Amen? Do you agree with that? That you are complete in Christ? He, he is the ruler of over every power and authority. But look at this in verse 11. This is the Apostle Paul. When you receive Christ, if you're a believer, you've given your life to, to Christ. Let me read. Your circumcision was not done by human hands. 
Instead, your circumcision was done by Christ. Wow. So Paul was reaching to that covenant of circumcision and applying that spiritual truth for us today. So that means this is not a means for us to be saved, but the circumcision of the heart is here's what Paul says as he continues. He put away the persons, he put away the person you used to be. Wow. And also at that time, since power ruled over you. So there's that cutting of that sinful nature that happened when you gave your life to the Lord. And also there's a mark that you belong to Him. And that you're not, there's no physical, but it's a spiritual circumcision. Because again, what's the purpose? For us, just like what happened to the Israelites, they were brought out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in their hearts. So now here's what God's what God is doing. The what? Making sure that our hearts are circumcised, that we're not just following rules and rituals, but really there's this circumcision not done by human hands, but by Christ because of what he has done for us at the cross. The forgiveness of sin, the sending of the Holy Spirit to mark us as sons and daughters of God. You see? The, the whole purpose of this as we un, unpack the meaning here now in our time, in the New Testament, in, this, in our context right now. So that's why you look at what happened. So after the circumcision, there was the Passover. They celebrated the Passover. You know, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated Passover. The last time, what is the Passover, of course? That is the two words, Pasqua, Passover. That means, remember the last plagues before leaving Egypt? You know, they killed the lamb. They put the blood of the on the doorpost and the angel of death, you know, walked through the whole nation of Egypt and whoever and whichever household that doesn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the firstborn died. And... That is the Passover. That was the last time they celebrated the Passover. And God says, you know, instructs them, before you go and conquer, this spiritual preparation is important. You have to understand in Exodus 12, it is required that you get circumcised first before you celebrate the Passover. And then they obeyed and they followed. And this is what it is. It's them, God rem reminding them that I am the one who rescued you, who brought you from slavery to freedom. My work, not your work. So they celebrated the Passover. And look at what happened after they celebrated. The day after the Passover, the very day, the next day, here's what happened. That very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Because before, in their wilderness, they were eating what? Manna. Here's what it is. Unleavened bread and roasted grain. They, For the first time, they tasted the fruit of the promise of the land flowing with milk and honey. Continuing in verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. Why is this important? Because when they were in the desert, God didn't stop the manna, even though they were grumbling and complaining that they've been eating manna all over, manna every day, and some of them grumbled, some of them died. That Here's what it is. It's still the same God, but a different provision. It's interesting because as I look at this, it's so interesting because again, as they enter a new season, God was bringing this to them that there would be a new provision. New season, new provision, but the same provider, which is God. Wow! Are you seeing what I'm seeing? As we apply that in our lives today, I want you to listen up. This is very important. <clears throat> As all of this opens up, there is a grace and a provision that God has given us, but yet as we enter the new season, there will be also a new provision that is coming on our way. But yet, don't forget, it is the same God who provides. Yes, we're going to taste the fruit of the promise. But yet, 
the spiritual preparation is very important. You're not, you're going to, you're going to have some grace on things that you have never seen before. Yes, it was a provision of manna. That was, as, you know, some theologian would say the bread from heaven. Actually, there's a description in Deuteronomy, but yet the, the bread of angels, as people would say, it was good. But yet for the coming season, they have to eat the produce of the land. No longer manna. It was God who stopped it. Sometimes there's going to be some provision that's going to stop. It's because God wants us to trust Him in a new way that He will provide for us. Yes, very important. And then let's continue. And there was no longer, no longer manna for the Israelite, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. So wow, all of this. The circumcision, but is the consecration that they are set apart for the Lord. They celebrated the Passover again, remembering. Haven't you noticed the moment that they cross Jordan? It's all about that remembrance, stone of remembrance. You know, the circumcision is about remembering who they belong to, and then this one and who what remembering who provides for them. This is what we're talking about because before we could go and conquer the land. Those three things is very important. Who God is and what He could do, right? Who you, who, who you are in Him. And the last one, the provision. And then if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, going back to the Ark of the Covenant, remember when we go to the Ark of the Covenant, so when you open the Ark, remember there are three things in there. The one is what? The law, the Ten Commandments, the tablets was there to remind them of the relationship that they have in Christ. What's the next one? The jar that was filled with manna, provision, and the staff of Aaron that, bud, that budded. All of those, God was preparing them. This is the same God that's going to lead you, that's going to fulfill what yes, it promised them, basically. So as we... Go back to the Passover. It's interesting because in, in Luke, we would see that Jesus, when they were celebrating Passover, when they were celebrating Passover, uses the bread and the juice or the cup as that truth about him. And that's why, because in, in when you look at John chapter 1, verse 29, it says that the next day, Talking about Jesus, Jesus coming towards him in this John the Baptist baptizing people. Here's what he said: Look, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sins, the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the same Lamb that was being killed every Passover celebration. He looked at Jesus and said, He is that Lamb. And now in our we celebrate communion. Here's what it is. Yes, of course, we can kill a lamb, but for us, as Jesus prepares us for this, and the spiritual significance of this today is that he is our lamb. When his body was, what, bruised for our transgression, as Isaiah would say, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus used this symbolism of the bread and the cup as we celebrate Passover today because of that, remembering what He has done for us. Because the reality is Jesus is our Passover. He is. The Passover Lamb who takes away our sins, who what put His who, who covered us with His blood for, so that we could have perfect righteousness and perfect obedience, which is impossible for us to achieve. And that's why when we celebrate communion, we're looking back as if we were there with Joshua. Of at that time when they're about ready to conquer, ready to take and possess the conquest is about to begin. But yet here's what it is. Just like in the time of Joshua, they didn't, they didn't do anything. It was God who led them. It was God who won the battle for them. I think... Communion is the reminder of that for us that, yes, we didn't do anything. It was Jesus who conquered death. It was Jesus, well, you know, it was Jesus who did it for us. 
All we have to do, just like the nation of Israel, is to obey and to put our trust in Him as He leads us. Today, that's what we're going to do. There will be no circumcision that's going to happen, but we're going to go celebrate the Passover as Jesus showed that example to us 2,000 years ago. So here's what we're going to do. Let me just read this. And here's what Jesus said in Luke 22, verses 14 to 15. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Hmm. they celebrating the Passover. Verse 19. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and, give, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread, the unliving bread. He said, this is my body. That symbolism. Again, that visual aid when we partake of the communion to understand what he has done. That you understand that you belong to him. You understand that when we partake this, that we are renouncing the flesh and we are partaking with Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And also when you look at this, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is in your covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And what is that? That we are no longer our own. That we cannot save ourselves. That if we're really going to fulfill and fight the battles ahead, we need to understand. Just like Joshua, because at the very end, he met this commander of the Lord's army and that's the ending here. And then Joshua asked him in chapter 5, verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. It's not on the screen. Just read your Bible. And then Joshua went up to ask to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Or some translation, are you for us or against us? Look at the answer. I mean, the commander of the Lord's army, this is a theophany or Christophany rather, because this is some theologian will say Christ appearing in the Old Testament. Because that title, the commander of the Lord's army, is a title given to Jesus. So here's neither, he replied, but as a so commander of the Lord army, uh, army of the Lord, I have now come. Wow. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? The covenant that was renewed, celebration of the Passover, and now God, Jesus, Christophany, appearing to him with a drawn sword, ready to go to war. But here's what he said. I am not, are you for me? or No, no, no. The question is no. I'm neither against you or for you. It's either, are you with me? Are you for me? And here's, what it says, and Joshua fell down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And what is that? Look at the description, verse 15. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandal for the place where you're standing is holy. Do You see, when God met Moses in the wilderness, that burning bush, that was the same description. This is Jesus telling Joshua, mm -hmm, this is a holy ground. That means with a drawn sword, I'm going to go win this battle for you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to go ahead of you. Same as we celebrate what? As we celebrate communion today. That when we partake this, God wanted us to what? To re God, God wanted us to, re to be reminded and not for us not to forget and for us to remember that it is God who had won the battle for us 2,000 years ago. Amen? So now, I want you to get the bread. And um, we're going to go. I want everybody to stand up, please. And then we're going to go celebrate our communion, which is our Passover. Take the moment. We're not in a hurry. Get that bread and and join me in a word of prayer, Lord, thank you. Lord, such a symbolism, but yet, Lord, a physical act that is overflowing with spiritual truth. Lord, that we belong to you, that we are your sons and daughters. Lord, it's also that 
to be reminded that we continually have to renounce our flesh and in in the world in order to follow you. But yet, Lord, thank you because you love us so much that you died for us, that you gave your body for us. As we partake this, Lord, we remember a covenant with you, a covenant that you initiated, a covenant of love, of relationship, of loyalty, of your goodness and your grace and your mercy being extended towards us. Lord, the word is loving kindness. Thank you, Lord. The body of Christ broken for you. Everybody says, thanks be to God. Let's partake of the bread. Let's take the cup. Lord, thank you. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Indeed, as John the Baptist declared, John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We are incapable of doing that. Lord, just like what happened in Joshua's time at the cross, Lord, you have removed the shame, the reproach of Egypt, our sin, our past so that we could take hold of what is ahead of us and lord as we celebrate passover communion thank you lord for that we are grateful thank you jesus for shedding your blood the blood of christ shed for you thanks be to god let's partake of the cup I want you to take this moment as you are standing to thank God. Say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you love me so much and thank you, God, that you have given your life to me. For some of you who are watching, God is reminding you that you belong to him. And this is because of what he has done for you, not because of what we could do for him. It's never so interesting about belongingness some people would try to fit in to belong no you don't have to because you belong because you are sons and daughters of God for some for if that just say thank you Lord for what you have done and for some you're watching you know God is challenging you reminding you cut off the flesh there is that that you need to cut off in your life. And whatever that is, is not something that is pleasing to the Lord. And if that's you, say, Pastor, that's me. And do a hand emoji as well. And write that in our comment section. And I want to pray for you. You know strongly that God is speaking to you. Cut off that flesh. Cut off that thing. Cut off that what's hindering you. And then you would see the provision. The mana will stop and a new provision will come. But we have to make that decision today. And if that's you, say, Pastor, that's me. Just do a hand emoji and I'll pray for you, Lord. Thank you. As we are partaking the communion, Lord, it's clear. You're speaking to us. You're reminding us there are some things in our lives that needs to be cut off. The removing of that flesh. The removing of something that is not pleasing to you. The removing of things that hinders us, Lord. A weakness, an addiction, someone, whatever that is. That's a challenge from God. Lord, I pray for my brother uh, Bong. Lord, for Rene Morales. For Charmaine. Lord, thank you for the reminder and thank you for their honesty, Lord. Today we're saying we no longer want this, Lord, if this is going to hinder us in our walk, in our relationship with you. We're choosing you. We're choosing, Lord, our relationship with you because, Lord, today we are renewing our covenant with you once again. As they have renewed their covenant, Lord, we are renewing our covenant, our relationship with you. Thank you for Mommy Ving as well, Lord. Thank you for speaking to Juvita Valenzuela. Lord, thank you for speaking to us, Lord, today as a spiritual family. Lord, thank you for 
I pray for Arnold as well. Lord, I pray for Miriam and Taboitz Morales. I pray for Perla Asuncion Goes watching right now. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, Lord. Thank you. We honor you, God. And today we choose you. And yes, indeed, Lord, we are stepping out in faith, just like the Israelites. We'll be vulnerable, Lord, when we give this, when we cut this things, Lord, that is not pleasing to you, but yet we are choosing you because we want it to be sons and daughters of obedience and not unbelief. Thank you, Lord. We honor you in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen and Amen and Amen and Amen.